welcome our presenters for today. I'm so excited to uh, introduce to you Lisa Bunker, who is the social media librarian at the Pima County Public Library in Arizona. And Cesar Garza is also uh, joining us today. He's the reference librarian and the chair of their social media team at the Austin Public Library in Texas. And you guys are in for a real treat. They've got some very inspirational work going on at their libraries. Welcome to the both of you. Hello. That was Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I'm, yeah, for some reason I'm a little shaky right now, so bear with me. Um, Oh, Lisa, it looks like you you just got muted. I'm going to let you unmute yourself. Oh, that's odd. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to um, say a little bit more about um, how we work at Pima County Public Library. Um, our social media is structured to maximize contributions from our branch libraries, and our training is very focused on why we are there and and on writing with authenticity and spontaneity. Uh, I oversee branch writers, but I really don't interfere a lot. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not a manager, I'm, I'm a librarian one. Um, I work in the communications and systems office with our PIO and our website team, but I try to get out into libraries as often as I can. Um, I do coordinate loosely with our PIO and our content planning calendar. Um, but I tend to write my own copy um, and, and tailor it for social media. For the last three years, I've also taught local businesses and nonprofits about effective social media with uh, two monthly classes, one on strategy and the other a Facebook lab where we get into the guts of an organization's page. I highly recommend that libraries share their expertise this way. It's a great community service. SSR is next. Hello. Hi everyone, this is Cesar Garza. I am from the Austin Public Library in Austin, Texas. And just to give you a little context about how I am involved with social media at my library, um, I am the, all the library that, all the social media that is produced at our library is actually centralized in a team that we call the Social Media Advisory Team. And it sounds pretty official, but it's actually just a committee of library staff from across the library system. On this team, there are reference librarians such as myself, there are youth librarians, there are branch librarians, and librarians from other departments across the system, so we all get together. And as a team, we govern the social media strategy of the library. We govern the pages that you find listed at on the library's website at library.austintexas.gov slash social. And so as I said, I'm a reference librarian. I'm based at the central library that you see pictured on the slide here. Um, and I'm the current team chair. And currently, I contribute content to the Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram page. So today, Lisa Bunker and I, we're going to cover four essential topics. Uh, those topics are going to be, the first one is going to be what is content curation and how can you fit it into your workday? The second topic will be how can you use your strategic plan to create posts for social media? The third topic will be how can you, how you can amplify your library's voice with the help of ambassadors? And the fourth topic will be how to add the spice of live broadcasts on Facebook. So we're going to turn the ball over to Lisa. Hi. Um, so I wanted to talk about curation because um, it's it's used in the description here, but um, it, it because it's a word that comes out of the museum world, um, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what it is and what it isn't. Uh, so this webinar is about taking it deeper, right? So one way to deepen what you offer is to articulate as a team why you're there, meaning there on social media, and, and who you're speaking to. So the curatorial mindset can unleash your creativity and spontaneity um, because it isn't a straitjacket. It's not strict rules about uh, what you can and can't post. It's a mindset where, um, just like a good collection development policy, you're 
um, in real life, in real time, um, picking and choosing things that you know are of interest to the people who, who are your audience on social media. Uh, so basically, it, it helps you focus so that you can plan ahead and, um, and in a spontaneous way, recognize opportunities as they, in real time as they happen. So, and I believe it saves time because it gives you, curation would give you useful parameters for content um, that, that you always have this kind of um, voice at the back of your head that, um, which is what I think of as a mindset, that it has, um, where you're picturing what you want to be posting and keeping an eye out for, for social media. So when you know why you're there, you're going to see stories all around you. Um, and furthermore, um, when you do it in a very conscious way, it can help align with your libraries and your community's goals. Um, and I can guarantee that your admin folks will be more supportive of social media um, when you demonstrate this. Uh, so if you want to put it in library terms, um, curation is a mix of collection development and storytelling. Um, and you're basing it all on specifically what your community needs and what its aspirations are, um, as well as the library strategic plan. Hopefully there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so as with our physical collections of books and movies, curation is only successful when you listen to what your users or customers or patrons value, what they find useful. If you're only pushing out messages about the library, you're not using social media to its fullest and taking advantage of its unique opportunities. And if all you do is broadcast, you're not inviting customers to participate. So I think you're sabotaging yourself because participation is how your audience grows. So you, you can broadcast, you can cut and paste from your website, you can cut and paste from your calendar, but you're going to be unhappy on social media with the results. True curation hits the sweet spot between what you need to convey about the library and what your readers will find useful and interesting. The highest compliment is when they share something you've posted with your friends. So the good news is you're already doing this at your public service desks and have for years. We know storytelling. We know how to hold an audience's attention. We know how to listen to our community's needs and aspirations. If your workflow is to copy and paste from the calendar or website, you're not going to capture the energy of what's going on at the beating heart of your library, and you're not going to take it deeper. And I'm behind a slide, so I'm going to forward um, there. So that, that the green area is the sweet spot I mentioned. Um, it, it, it shouldn't be too much, um, you know, focusing on just what your customers want, it, and it shouldn't be too much you talking about yourself. What you want to find is that space in the middle where, uh, where you both meet and, um, and what you post is interesting and useful. Yeah, you're doing this already. You, you've been storytelling f forever, probably, if you've been in libraries as long as I have. Um, and it's, I think, we've kind of done, uh, you know, I've been in libraries for almost 40 years. I, I think we do a lousy job of telling our own story. Social media gives us a chance to tell that story in a deeper way um, and, and really focus on telling the story of what we're doing and not, and not other people's stories. So here's some examples of curated content. This may help illustrate what is meant by curation. So you could link to an article about a neighborhood's history. You could post fun and games about books, reading, and libraries. Real-time video of the child who came in to read you a poem. Report on a big program you just had. Or just post spectacular photos of where you live. Um, and what we're going to do further on is reverse engineer some posts and, and, and go from a real post and talk about how, how they um, illustrate these different kinds of content um, that you can do in libraries.
But how do you decide what to curate? What topics and messages do you focus on? Um, this is part of a handout that is in your kit. Um, I, have, I have this graphic on it um, above and a space below for you to um, make your own version of it. This is, this is a very uh, kind of personal um, chart of what we're doing at Pima County. Um, so, and it helps me, it gives you an idea of sort of what's at the back of my mind, what I'm always looking for, what stories I'm, I'm uh, trying to be attuned to um, around me so that I can get them on social media. So having a chart like this is also a great uh, brainstorming tool, um, not just for you, but for your colleagues, with your admin, with your marketing folks. Um, and it, it's a list of the things we want more people to be aware of in our 26 libraries. So um, one would be, and it's one of several, but um, we're a welcoming space for everyone, and we are busy. Um, so that's one of the messages I want to convey on social media. But I'm not going to say that. I'm going to show that. So underneath are uh, examples of some of the things I've posted that illustrate um, that, that message we want to send without saying it kind of explicitly. We understand what Tucson wants and needs, um, and I, I hope that when you come to our social media accounts that you get a sense for Tucson, that, that you, um, it, it feels like Tucson, it feels like it could not be anywhere else. Um, and, and this is a very conscious goal um, that we want to convey uh, how, how much a part of the community um, here in Pima County that, that the library is. So, and the third key message our library has is we are a place where people get surprised and inspired. And honestly, it, this is where social media just gets really fun. Um, the more you can surface the stories that are about experiments you're doing, about new things you're trying, um, yes, story time, of course, yes, job help, of course, but um, focusing on where, where you're trying new things and where you're going to surprise customers, um, these are the kinds of things that are just extremely shareable and, um, and tend to do very, very well on social media. So these are three statements of purpose for us here in Pima County. Um, these statements can also come from your strategic plan, um, but they can also be um, how, it can also be a message where you're trying to work against a negative perception. So let's say the negative perception is that people think the library is out of touch. So make a list of the things that you can talk about on social media or share on social media that counter that message and, and share how, how, um, how really relevant you are in today's, in today's world. The next slide's a sample of our content strategy calendar. We use the free database software called Airtable. And uh, we review this um, in our meetings at, at, for the um, communications and systems office. We also, once a month, share the highlights of this with staff because we're encouraging them to write book lists and blog posts that, that fit with the kinds of content that, um, that we are um, emphasizing both on the website and on social media. But you know what? I, you know, this, this calendar is super helpful. I actually pay more attention to what people are talking about that morning on Facebook than, than to a library angle. I'm very curious when I log into social media in the morning Where's the day's energy headed? What's the mood of the day? This is curation too, and, it, and it's a commitment to listening what people are concerned about at that moment. Um, your version of it could be going out onto the public desk and just listening to what people are, what the buzz is, what people are talking about at the desk. Um, this is real research for social media because it, it allows you to curate in a way that is, is timely and, um, and just real that it's real life. Um, so this is the reverse engineer section. Um, I wanted to show, I mean, some of these are like really 
huge reach posts, but I really wanted to show some of the posts that, that are just really good ordinary posts um, so that you could see what, what I'm talking about. Um, this is, you know, I, I told you that we have a very distributed system here where branch staff have autonomy um, to post and curate what they know to be of interest in, in their neighborhoods. And so this is one of our libraries, it's Wheeler Taft Abbott Senior Library. And um, this is the screenshot of the insights for this post. So you're seeing information that the public can't see. Um, but it, you can see on the left, Lupita's posted, uh, it was a regular series, um, and this was today's act of kindness, donate food to the community food bank. And um, sh underneath, she's given um, links so that everything you need to be successful at this, this challenge, this, this activity, is there for you. And, and the graphic is, um, is what's most needed at the food bank. So let's reverse engineer this. Why was it successful? Why did it work? Honestly, the photograph is boring and, you know, gurus will tell you this is way too much text for a Facebook post and she's got more than one link. But, um, it, you know, at the time, this page had about 400 likes and uh, if you look at the reach of over 1,200, she's, she's definitely beaten the uh, Facebook algorithm um, and reached 300% of the number of people who, who like the page. So that meant that there was a lot of sharing and a lot of interest in, in this post. Um, I, I think this one boils down to knowing what people are talking about, timeliness, that this was, you can see December, early December and 2016 after the election when we know a lot of people were looking at ways to uh, give back to the community um, and just the time of year when people are focused on that and um, and just how I think the completeness of the text worked for her in this situation. So um, yeah, th that's uh, post your own reasons why you think that was successful. I, I'd be curious um, to, to hear what you think about it. Okay, here's the next slide. Oh, by the way, um, we're working with Lupita right now on a year-long kindness project um, that, that will start next year. I'm very excited about that. All right. <laughs> so this, this is just kind of silly and geeky. Um, and this wasn't as huge a uh, reach as what Lupita did. Our This page is the main page, and this page at, the, at this point had about almost 10,000 likes. Um, so, so this isn't 100% even of, of the number of likes, but it's still a very, very solid post and definitely um, beat Facebook's algorithm. Um, if you're curious what I mean by that, um, take the number of likes of your page and divide it by 5% or to 7%. And this is the worldwide average of the number of people who see a post. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons for that, but um, if you're beating that five to 7%, uh, you're beating Facebook's algorithm and doing a very good job indeed. So uh, <laughs> let's reverse engineer this one. Um, this was to illustrate um, our history of innovation and our decades of experience um, providing new things that are needed by the community. Um, it's also very hyper-local, which is something that is um, a high priority of ours. Um, and, and just, I thought people would just get a kick out of it, that huge CPU, um, the, the, you know, where are the women? What, no internet? Um, so this post has 16 comments and, um, uh, this isn't our highest hit. Um, one of our branches had a post that went over 1 million, 425,000 in reach. Um, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not showing that one, but um, that, to, that gives you an idea of, of how big something can get, even from a, a rather small branch library. 
This is an example of something that went viral for libraries, um, but the credit goes to the Cairo Area District Library. And um, Erin, you know, this had been a regular series she was doing for the library. And um, so she, she was kind of surprised that this took off the way it did. Um, but it's a fabulous example um, and a rare example of direct library messaging really working on social media. Um, if you are familiar with the Libraries Transform campaign, you know that there's some beautifully designed graphics that come from um, the American Library Association. Um, and they're, they're excellent, but she didn't use those here. She, um, they, the library had put one of the phrases on their marquee, so she went out to the front of the library, and instead of using a very kind of polished, wonderful graphic, she made it real, and she, she posted a picture of the, you know, the phrase on their marquee, and it just worked. It, it really went viral um, and was made a bunch of major blogs. I think even, um, oh, I forget. Yeah, anyway, it, it just, it really made a big splash, and it was so exciting for her to do that. So I think the key here is timing, it's clarity, it's simplicity, um, and the message is, it, well, it's a combination of message and something hyperlocal, which, which makes it real. It, it takes a marketing message and made it real. Um, part, of, part of the context of the time here was that this was March 2017, and fake news was being discussed everywhere. So it, th this post really did hit a nerve. Uh, this is a real simple one that I've used twice now, um, I, and it was very simple to do. I took a picture of my hand with a pen in it and put the text over it and invited customers to, um, to share what their two words would be. Um, so here what's curation is that it's, it's a simple challenge that um, I hoped would be irresistible to respond to. Um, hopefully, as soon as you read that, you know, what the text was, you yourself were thinking of those two words and, and thinking how fun it would be to share them with other people. Um, that's kind of what I mean by irresistible. Um, this post, uh, that, that I reposted it recently and it got 188 comments, comments, which was very fun. Um, and, and again, it was super simple to do. You could reuse uh, my image if you want or, or just take your own. Challenges like this um, really can produce some fabulous participation with your readers. They are a risk. Um, so here's what I've learned about doing these kinds of participation challenges. You do need a decent, decent following for it to work. Um, if, if you have a small number of likes on the page, um, not enough people are going to see what you post to, um, for, for it to really kind of catch fire. Um, you do need to make the ask super easy. You can't make it very complicated, um, like asking, having a two-part question or challenge. Just make it one, keep it super simple, and something that, um, that people can do uh, quickly. But also, as I try to do here, also sort of touch, um, touch the emotions, touch things like people's aspirations and wishes and, um, and you know, uh, reflections on, on their life. And um, this kind of thing is uh, really useful, not useful, but um, it, it works with social media behavior where a lot of people use social media to define themselves. And, and define themselves to friends and, and, um, and to the public. So that was another sort of um, reason I posted this, is that it helps with that, you know, people, it, it lets people shine online um, on social media um, by, by posting something um, about themselves. Um, and so, yeah, make it emotional but not icky kind of privacy-wise. This was another challenge. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of libraries did this this summer. Um, I redid the graphic. Um, I picked a graphic that was um, was a GIF actually that I found. And yes, I'm pronouncing it that way. Um, so here's some other examples of challenges you can do. Um, what book was so scary you refused to read it again? 
right? Type, but our, yeah, that's the title. Write a haiku about something um, that everyone is super excited about. Um, for us here in the desert, it might be a rainstorm. And, and we've done that. We've invited people to write haiku about the rain clouds and, and rain, summer rain in the desert. And um, it, it did really, really well. I think we got 45 haiku. All right, speaking of rain, one of the things I have wanted to achieve on social media is to be the library in real time. And, and that's what this one did for us. Again, what's curation is, hyper is that it's hyper-local. Um, there is no direct um, association with the library here except to convey the message that um, we live here too. We are fascinated by what you're fascinated by. And, um, and hey, you know, boy, rain and, and our normally dry riverbeds full of water. So I'm always looking for examples of what it's like to live here, the beauty, the weather, the history. Um, and this is the 30 second video I took over my lunch time, lunch hour of, of a normally bone dry riverbed. And it had a huge reach. You can see the numbers here. But what I adored about this was actually the conversations we had in the comments. Um, people shared stories about past floods, they wondered about the history of the river, they discussed rainstorm safety. And I, I kept up with these comments and was the library in real time posting articles that answered people's questions, posting historical photographs, and sharing links to um, other amazing um, articles and, and helpful things um, and, and amazing storm photography. So um, yeah, so the message here is we, the library staff, live here too, and we get Tucson. We are family, um, and the library makes everything better. And my last reverse engineer um, is, you know, I'm just always looking for things that I know customers would be interested in because they ask for them at the desk. So this is another way of sort of doing collection development, but on social media, for social media, looking for the kinds of things that are web examples of what you buy for your, for your physical collection. Um, so I'm worried about time, so we're gonna go forward here. So part of the curation, it, you can't curate unless you know why you're there. So I wanted to quickly go over um, some whys and how they can support getting deeper on social media. When I train staff, I start with a brainstorming session about why we're on social media in the first place. Um, what, they, what happens is that they learn through this exercise that they know more than they think they do. And it gives me a chance to share real examples of, of their suggestions or possible drawbacks if, if there's a misperception. Um, so here are some examples of actual whys for our social media. We want to drive people to our library website. We want to build loyalty and trust with customers. I have lots of customers who are online and I want to provide customer service to them. We frequently have news that we need to get out quickly. Or we have programming that taxpayers should know about that's never advertised. Um, I'll bet you do this too. You do programs um, in the refugee community. You do programs for teen moms. Um, kind of closed audience things where, because you're not worried about um, attendance, you, you may not talk about them in the media, and you should. It, it, these are great stories that the public should know about. Um, and another why, the final why I have, um, I'll talk about here, is that we have customers outside our immediate area or, or that haven't been in the library for a long time, and we want to entice them back. Really, social media is the best tool we have for sharing the deeper story of the library in real time in our own voices. And um, that I think is just the genius of social media and, and uh, what's in it for libraries. Um, I'm gonna skip over these very quickly. Um, these are some samples of handouts that are in the kit um, that you have that I hope um, complement uh, the kinds of things that we're talking about. I also have a challenge for you that is another handout um, that may help you rethink your workflow. Um, if, if the kinds of things that I've been talking about as curation 
you're thinking, oh my God, I don't have time to do that. Or, or where will I find the time? Um, what I hope this homework challenge will do is, is help you think differently about how, how your workflow um, happens and, and, and how you plan for social media. So, all right, I'm gonna turn it over to Cesar. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. This is Cesar Garza again from the Austin Public Library, and I have returned to tell you all a little story. It's a short story um, starring the Austin Public Library supporters that we call our social media ambassadors, and in sharing the story with you, I'm hoping to just illustrate or to give you an idea of what you can do at your own library if you want to amplify your library's voice on social media. So to get started, uh, we need to ask, you know, who are these ambassadors? The ambassadors of the Austin Public Library are simply citizens of Austin, or Austinites for short, uh, who love the library and share that love on social media. And it's really as simple as that. And it's also simple to sign up because you don't need to apply to be a social media ambassador. You simply need to go to the library's website at library.austintexas.gov slash ambassador. So when you go to that website, you add your name and your email to our email list for the ambassadors. And then about once a month, you'll get a short personal email from the Austin Public Library. And I would emphasize that the email is short because it's not a newsletter. I would emphasize that the email is personal because again, it's not a newsletter. It's actually just a letter from a library staff member to the ambassadors as a group. And in that letter, the staff member will encourage the ambassadors as a group to use a certain hashtag to uh, promote a certain library event or just to help uh, promote the library in any way they can. So if you were an Austinite, a citizen of Austin, and you were a social media ambassador, you would uh, either use the hashtag that we email you about and or you could use the Hash, the, the, the permanent hashtag, basically, that is the, the program hashtag, hashtag APL ambassador. And in, when you use that hashtag, we're basically just trying to encourage you to be as creative as you can to promote the library, whether it's posting what you're reading, what you checked out from the library, what, what your favorite branch is, what you're looking forward to, anything, any, any, almost anything having to do with the library, you can uh, share it, use the hashtag APL ambassador, and that, that's how you are, that's how you become an ambassador. And I'm happy to report that to date, as we record this webinar, December 2017, we have 1,100 Austin Public Library ambassadors, and the list seems to be growing. So we're excited about that. So now I want to talk about why, um, you know, why we did this, why we organized the ambassadors, why we why well, I think we need them now more than ever. Uh, and one of the reasons why is on the next slide. So this slide that you see on your screen, it is a screenshot of an article from the blog of Hootsuite.com. The, the blog is titled, Organic Reach on Social Media is Declining. Here's what to do about it. I'm not gonna go over the whole article, but I just wanted to share it with you because it talks about organic reach. Now I know that uh, I think Lisa did address organic reach and in, in a previous part of this webinar series, organic reach was addressed as, um, it's basically just free advertising. It's the number of people that see any given post that you publish on your social media page uh, without you having to pay for it. So it's free advertising and unfortunately, the organic reach that we have depended on for so long is declining. One takeaway from this article is that organic reach for Facebook pages fell 52% in 2016. That's 52%. And in the next article I'm gonna show you here on the screen, it is uh, an article from the website socialmediatoday.com. The article is titled, New Study Finds Facebook Page Reach Has Declined 20% in 2017. So we just I just showed you an article that said the reach declined 52% in 2016 and, and then it declined a further 20% in 2017. So clearly these networks are trying to move us away from free, getting anything for free, I'm sorry to say. But um, 
that one of the takeaways from this article on socialmediatoday.com is where it says that organic reach on Facebook has been in decline since late 2013. Now, I have managed a Facebook page for a library since 2010, so I have seen firsthand how the organic reach has changed over time, how indeed this is true. It is now really hard to get your content in people's news feeds, and I can tell you um, this decline has, was one of the reasons why at the Austin Public Library we organized the Social Media Ambassadors Program. So that's just one reason. There are actually a few that I'm going to share with you now. Um, one is, of course, the decline of organic free reach. A second reason is the increasing emphasis on ads, which costs money. A third reason is the increasing demands on staff time. And, um, you know, as time goes on, these networks, they evolve. They become more sophisticated. And the more sophisticated they become, the more time they require from staff to actually be effective at using them. And now, as you've seen, especially on Facebook, Facebook is now much more ad-driven from the page perspective. They want you to, they want to pump, you, they want you to pump money into ads so that you can get in people's news feeds. But perhaps the biggest reason of all why we uh, need our social media ambassadors is uh, reality. It's the reality of library land that we all inhabit. Um, here at the Austin Public Library, uh, we have no formal social media budget, and we don't have any social media staff, which is to say library staff that was hired solely for the purpose of managing social media. When I uh, introduced myself earlier in this webinar, I pointed out that I'm a reference librarian, indeed I am, but all the social media I contribute is in addition to what I was actually hired to do, and that's a true for all my coworkers on the social media team here, and my hunch is that most of you listening right to this webinar right now are probably in the same situation. So we devised this ambassadors program to uh, basically implicitly share the responsibility and the fun of social media with our ambassadors, because I think that in a very literal way, these our social media ambassadors, they embody the organic free reach that now eludes us. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example of how this is true and how this has played out for us very recently. So recently, we in Austin, we opened a new central library downtown. It is the, the library pictured in on the slide here. And we mobilized our social media ambassadors to help us promote the new central library using the hashtag new central library. And uh, when we did that, it, they helped us sort of amplify, raise awareness, uh, uh, sort of generate chatter in the community about this very beautiful building that opened on October 28th, 2017. So how did this happen? I would say that this the, the way that we mobilized the ambassadors actually happened over the long term. It didn't happen right away. It didn't happen overnight. We launched the ambassadors program in November of 2015, uh, knowing that the new central library would open. So this was a tactical decision we made. And then over a two-year period from November 2015 when we launched the program to October 2017 when the new central library opened, occasionally we would email the ambassadors as a group to give them an update on the new central library. And there was, we already knew that there was a lot of interest and excitement about this new building, and usually there is in a community when you open a new library. Uh, so anytime we email them an update, we would say things like, you know, use hashtag new central library. And they would share the updates. And just in doing that, they would, they would generate organic free reach for us. And that's, I suppose you can say that the crescendo, the peak of all these efforts to amplify, to uh, mobilize our social media ambassadors to ampli amplify the new central library, it happened on October 22nd, 2017, when we allowed a group of our ambassadors, a ticketed group of our ambassadors, to get a sneak preview of the new central library before it opened to the public on October 28th. Um, so the way that we did it, we used a website called eventbrite.com. We used eventbrite.com to issue free online tickets to our ambassadors. One of the stipulations was certainly the ticket was free, getting attending the preview was free, but you had to be a social media ambassador in order to attend, and each ticket allowed an ambassador, plus up to three of their guests, including children, to come to the sneak preview. And when that happened, um, 
we got a lot, a lot of photo, photographs and a lot of excitement and emojis being used when they saw the, for the new central library for the first time. And um, that there was a lot of more orga organic and free reach for us. So on the next slide, this is a picture I took myself during the sneak preview for the social media ambassadors. This is a group, the, tick, the group of ambassadors with their families and friends. They are gathered in the first floor of the new central library at the foot of the atrium that actually goes up six stories. Uh, the gentleman on the lower right corner is the director of the Austin Public Library. And I arranged for our, my director to welcome the ambassadors before we just set them loose into the building to start tweeting and posting and using the hashtag. And, um, and so he did that. He only welcomed them for about five minutes. And I insisted, that, I insisted that it be a very short welcome because we didn't want to hold the ambassadors back from just going wild in the new building. So now before this preview happened, uh, we, over the two years before this, uh, from November 2015 to October of 2017, um, we tracked how much the hashtag APL ambassador was being used, and we can see that th it was being used most on the, the three, the big three social media platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So if you ever have a chance, or if you're ever interested, I would encourage you to go to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, look up the hashtag APL Ambassador, and the hashtag New Central Library for the post dated October 22nd, 2017, which was the day of the sneak preview, just to see what kind of posts uh, they put up. There was, qu there was a few hundred of them, especially on Instagram. So uh, for this webinar, I created a little collage. On this slide is just the collage of screenshots that I took from uh, the hashtag APL Ambassador on Facebook, hashtag APL Ambassador on Instagram, and on Twitter, um, dated October 22nd. I just wanted to show you all what the posts kind of look like, and it was just a, a myriad, it was just a very diverse group of perspectives and comments, and it was all just very exciting. Okay, so what are the takeaways? What are the lessons and tips I can share with you about the ambassadors program? Uh, the foremost one, the first one, is that at your social media ambassadors, they share and thus amplify your community's library love, hashtag library love, from the grassroots because, as I said, they are simply um, average, everyday citizens of your community who want to just share their love for the library on social media. Uh, another lesson uh, that I gleaned from this is that ambassadors are a long-term strategy to both organize and build your library's online identity. Um, I would emphasize long-term. It is something you, you have to try to think of the big picture, and over the long term, um, you can build them up, build up the, uh, you know, build up the group of ambassadors, and then over time, they can become a, a fort. You know, they can be some, you know, like something that you can really count on, a group of people you can count on when you need to get the word out. Um, if any of you listening to this webinar have any interest in trying an ambassador's program, I do have a few tips for you. The first tip is just to make it simple to sign up um, and like the library, open to everyone. The second tip would be to build an email list. Here at the Austin Public Library, we use MailChimp, which is an email marketing platform that you have to subscribe to, but there are other email marketing platforms out there. Um, there's another one that's called Constant Contact, um, and if you wanted to, depending on the, your budget or if you couldn't subscribe to a platform, I think just even creating just a simple email list on an Excel spreadsheet or even just in a, a certain email account to use for the library and just emailing the group, um, it can really be as easy as that. Um, I think that it's important to attach some sort of action to the, 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 the action of signing up to be an ambassador. Like, get, you want to make them do something to become one. You know, even just signing up for an email list, I think, is, is more than enough. Another tip I have for you is to strategize. Uh, so you build an email list and you strategize the emails long term. There's the key word again, long term, based on what I would call your library's big moments. Uh, a big moment is just a high profile event in the timeline of your library, such as opening a new facility, launching a new service, a new program, a new partnership. And once you've identified those big moments, uh, you turn one of them, or maybe all of them, 
uh, into an incentive to sign up as an ambassador. So here at the Austin Public Library, when we extended the sneak preview to the social media ambassadors, we, we first of all, we knew we were going to do the sneak preview, and then we started promoting the fact that that if you were a social media ambassador of the Austin Public Library, you would get a chance to get a sneak preview of this new central library. But in order to get a ticket, to get a golden ticket, if you will, to this sneak preview, you had to be a social media ambassador. And when we started promoting that, our email list went from like uh, 300 to like 800 people, <laughs> so like hundreds of people signed up anticipating that we were going to do this for them. And we did. And so um, that's definitely a big tip for me. Okay, so now I'm turning this over to Lisa. Well, I'm going to actually jump in. This is Jennifer. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Both of you, so many, so many ideas. I'm going to just have a little pause here to uh, share some of the questions that I've seen come through with you all. And I'm going to work backwards. Cesar, I'm going to ask you a couple of the questions that came up. Sure. Um, one of them was uh, uh, specific to who picks the hashtags that APL uses. The, the social media advisory team, the social media team of the library, um, we pick them. We just sort of survey our pages. We just try to get a sense of what is trending and what we think we can use over time. Uh, again, over the long term, the hashtags that we've identified are the ones that we used uh, frequently. So. Excellent. Fantastic. And I'm curious how many other libraries have picked up on library love, hashtag library love. <laughs> There's, there's actually quite a few, I mean, we, that hashtag library love, I believe, was trending long before we even got to it, to, to identify Excellent. it as a trending, but it's out there, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's we, definitely. We used it to publicize our um, rebranding campaign. Oh, excellent. Fantastic. Oh. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, there, there was a question about um, sort of how you orient your ambassadors, especially in terms of making sure that their posts are uh, available publicly. So do you provide them with some guidelines and, and recommendations for how to post? In, we don't provide them any formal guidelines other than what we say, what we articulate in the email, the letter that we send to them as a group. Um, it's a letter written by a library staff member in the first person. It goes something like, Dear Social Media Ambassadors, my name is Cesar Garza. I'm a reference librarian at the Central Library. We have this new Central Library opening. We would love it if you use the hashtag new Central Library. And we don't really go much beyond that because we feel like the ask is just to use hashtag and we kind of leave it up to them to decide how they're going to use it um, for the most part it's their posts all the posts are library friendly so if we wanted to re retweet them or share them on Facebook or reground them on Instagram we do that but we definitely are careful about things like that so if we see uh, uh, an ambassador use an image with the hashtag APL ambassador if we don't think it's appropriate for the Austin Public Library Instagram we won't regram it or, or retweet it so Okay, excellent. And then there are a couple folks were curious um, if you've either had negative posts from uh, related to the ambassador program or are there any downsides to having social media ambassadors? We have, I haven't seen any negative posts um, because the nature of the group is, is that they love the library and we try to, and we, the way that we describe it, the way that we have them sign up for the email list, the message is always, you're, we're so grateful you're doing this. We know you love the library, and now show us how you love the library. So I don't see any downsides. It's just uh, the only downside might be just it's just the challenge of maintaining it, of trying to find ways to engage them, of, of um, uh, finding topics for emails or hashtags they might use that they, will, that they will actually use. You know, that's the challenge. It's just actually getting them to do it. That's the biggest challenge. But it's not a downside to me. It's just the challenge. Okay, excellent. All right, and um, there were a few questions specific to Lisa's portion. Um, Lisa, somebody loved the, if you could write the two words um, and that your that graphic you created, somebody said, can we use that? <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, it, it, it was something I did just last week. So if you go to the Pima County Public Library Facebook page, um, it, it's, it should be in the photographs folder. Um, I, if you're a member at the uh, Libraries and Social Media Facebook group, um, which I invite you all to, um, I, I can repost a link to it there. And um, a number of us share graphics like that 
in this group and in another group um, that, uh, um, um, oh, I'm blanking out, um, but yeah, uh, Jessica Bacon started. Um, so that there are some Facebook groups where libraries share successful images like that that they've made or found. So, yeah. Yeah, excellent. And, and Jessica was a presenter on our first session. Yeah. So yeah, definitely head back over. I did post her link to the um, shareable click uh, group Good. earlier when somebody was asking about uh, how do you, we, that, a couple of people commented, Lisa, that they, they don't have the engagement that you've been seeing and, you know, wondered what are some tricks. So I definitely recommended the shareable click, click as a way to see some of those posts that libraries are making that have gotten traction. So definitely uh, check that out as well. And then Lisa, one more question for you. Um, somebody brought up the issue of, in terms of curating content and staying true to your brand, um, for example, the library's brand guidelines at this library state that photography of people, events, and programs should be used rather than illustrations or GIFs. How do you sort of work through uh, those different sort of branding policies if, if, you, if you need to coordinate with other folks that are making those decisions? Yeah, um, it, it's helpful that I work in the same office and was actually on our branding um, committee. Um, we have a very similar uh, part of our branding where uh, the only images, for example, that can be used on the website are professional photographs. Um, we prefer things that uh, are local and uh, taken, you know, taken of our own programming. But when we don't have that, we go to, you know, we ha have access to Getty images for that. We, we try to minimize uh, stock photography as much as possible. Um, on the other hand, we saw social media as uh, a place where, and, and, and for now it's the only place that staff can post their own photographs. Um, they, they, because of the branding, they, they can't be on the website. Um, so social media was seen as kind of an outlet for that creativity. And, um, and, and photography is something that we have trained staff on, you know, how to, how to use photography to tell the story, that kind of thing. Um, it, if we have a barrier photography-wise, it's that we have to get written permission for everyone who's recognizable in a photograph. Um, and uh, that that can be onerous um, and definitely get in the way of spontaneity. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's helpful. And I know that we touched a little bit on policies. Um, we, we've gathered some policies that folks have both in, for internal library policies and external that we're going to be sharing uh, in a little bit on Web Junction. So we'll, we'll be sure and let folks know on these event pages when that's available. All right, well, in the interest of time, let's continue on. And for those of you that need to leave at the top of the hour, we will continue to record. Uh, so you can certainly uh, circle back and listen to the rest of it when you have a chance. So thank you for being here. Lisa. All right. Um, what I wanted to show here um, are some examples of what you can accomplish um, when you have uh, your whole staff behind you and um, and at this point, I've been training staff on social media for, oh gosh, maybe nine years. So we, we have, uh, we definitely hit critical mass as far as number of people that uh, know what we're doing on social media. It's also part of the training we give to every new member. Um, so I, I'm part of the new, new employee training, um, and, and I talk about our goals on social media and, and social media ethics. Um, so, um, if you remember our goals here at Pima County, I, I want people who read our Facebook page to say at least once a month, God, I love my library, or wow, I didn't know I could do that at the library, or the library helps make our community strong, or I am welcomed at my library. And I can't, I can't, sitting in the fourth floor of Main Library, I can't do that without the help of my fellow staff members. And um, I, um, I know many libraries have policies that restrict who can post directly to social media. Um, so I kind of wanted to make an argument 
for using your staff as ambassadors as well, um, because this is how you're going to get the stories of the libraries and of the library and people's lives. It's how you get stories of staff excellence in real time. It's how you find ways to connect with people and local business and community groups. And it really does reinforce the sense that the library is synonymous with your community when you have um, many more of your staff members uh, posting as the library on social media. My, what, what I say is these frontline staff members represent the library face to face every single day. As far as I'm concerned, they are the library voice and this is the library brand, and, um, and I don't really interfere a lot with what they want to do with their branch pages. So this is, isn't this wonderful? This is actually a photograph that is three times as wide, um, but one of our branches uh, serves uh, neighborhoods that have a very high number of recent immigrants and refugees, and they've made a very concerted effort to um, have staff that speak these languages. Um, we, we have a great um, telephone translation service, um, but whenever possible, we try to have staff that, that can speak these languages. So what this branch did for their Facebook page was um, take pictures of the you know, 15, 16 staff members uh, holding up signs of the languages they speak natively and, um, and then share it on their Facebook page. We have reused this photograph to show, you know, in a number of kind of similar contexts. There's no way I could have really gotten this picture very easily, and, and it was all on this branch's initiative. Your staff are ambassadors, too. This photograph came from a staff member. Um, Read to a Dog is one of our most popular programs and extremely photogenic. Um, I can't be there to photograph, um, but the staff can be, and, and they feed me wonderful things like this. Uh, this is another story that, um, uh, let's see, Amar, Amaria, if I'm pronouncing her name right, uh, and her twin sister come into the library in Sarita a lot, and um, this one day, Amaria came in and, and asked Tanisha, if she, the librarian, if she could recite a poem. So. Um, I, I won't show it, but this is a video of Amaria reciting the poem at the library, and um, Tanisha listened to her, her mouth dropped, um, asked Amaria and her mom if she could get permission, if she would read the story again for the camera, and, um, and then got it on social media that day. And, it, you know, it, this is just gold. Um, so, yeah, I, I can't say it enough. Be hyperlocal. Share in real time more often than you schedule posts. Um, empower your frontline staff with tools like cameras or tablets and training and time. Um, and, and honestly, at, at your locations, have a camera or tablet with a camera uh, handy for staff to use. Cesar, it's your turn. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, everyone. This is Cesar Garza again. So I am from the Austin Public Library, and we're in the final leg of our webinar here. I'm just going to talk about Facebook Live and how we've used it here at APL. Um, I know in the survey that um, Web Junction and TechSoup have been sharing with, with folks, um, uh, I know a, lot of, a number of responses have been about how you do live broadcasting. So I'm hoping to just very quickly show you how it can be done and how it's not as hard as you think. So here at the Austin Public Library, uh, to date, uh, December 2017, we have recorded 28 broadcasts. They are archived in the Videos tab of the Austin Public Library Facebook page. Um, if you browse through that tab or at the direct link that, that we're sharing with you now, you'll see that our live videos have uh, range in topic from crafting to Austin history to eBooks to live music and uh, the closing of the old central library, which we had to close in order to open the new central library. And uh, on average, our viewership during the broadcast has been from zero, you know, no one watching, to uh, 30 viewers. And that's just an average, and that 
I, I hope that's not discouraging to people, but for a, a library Facebook page, uh, my observation has been that it's not that bad. So although the viewership during the broadcast might be discouraging, where you get your most views really happens after the broadcast is over. So for the Austin Public Library, we've had uh, live videos after the fact that have gotten from 350 video views to 6,100 video views. And that last one, the 6,100 video views, it was a video, a, a live broadcast about the closing of the old Central Library in the lead up to the opening of the new Central Library. And that video was one of a series of Facebook Lives. It's our flagship series that we call Q and APL Live. And this is a series in which we pose a library-related question, and then we answer it live. And as it happens, we encourage people who might be watching uh, to ask their own questions or leave their own comments, and we answer it live. And um, so one way you can think about the Q&A APL Live is that is, uh, it's basically just a library FAQ on your website that you then turn into a Facebook Live episode. Um, So, you know, speaking of questions, uh, I think a question that we all have to ask ourselves and maybe other people will ask is why, why do we need to do Facebook Live? Do we even need to do it? And I would say the answer is a big yes. Yeah, I think we have to do it now. Uh, and one reason is uh, an article I'm going to share with you, and the, the link is going to be shared as I speak. Um, it is an article on the website of Forbes.com. It is titled Top 10 Video Marketing Trends and Statistics Roundup 2017. Just the screenshot alone on the slide here um, has two big talking points, uh, two big points that hit home at the top. One is over 500 million, that's half a billion people, are watching video on Facebook every day. Another uh, big point here is internet video traffic will be over 80% of all consumer internet traffic in four years. <laughs> so uh, the gist here is that uh, Facebook's, uh, our news feeds, especially the Facebook news feed, is primed for video. So I would say, I would argue that uh, Facebook, the benefit of Facebook Live is pretty straightforward. A video on Facebook these days uh, uh, generates stronger customer engagement. It is more likely to be shared, and in the sharing, that's where you get more reach, and it's that organic free reach that is uh, so elusive to us these days. So now, I'm going to share with you some uh, four tips about how to do Facebook Live, and I hope you will find them very helpful. So my first Facebook Live tip is just to borrow ideas from other libraries, see what other libraries are doing. There is an article on the website of libraryjournal.com that is titled Live from the Library. It was published in April of 2017, April of this year. And full disclosure, this article features uh, the Austin Public Library Facebook Live, but it features us alongside other libraries across the country. And I think this uh, article might give you some ideas. For instance, there's other libraries that are doing um, weekly virtual reference sessions. They are other libraries doing reader's advisory, such as What to Read Wednesday. There's other libraries that are using Facebook Live to give a tour of a new exhibition that is being held at the library. And um, so I think it's a worthwhile, I think it's a worthwhile um, article to look at. So uh, the Facebook Live tip number two would be to just equip yourself. Uh, use a smartphone and tripod. All you need is your personal smartphone. And in the picture on the slide here, those are my hands in the lower right corner, my hands peeking into the frame. I'm holding a, a six-inch six-inch smartphone tripod. Um, and this uh, only costs about 10 or $15 depending on where you buy it from, but I found this very useful because it actually helps me hold my smartphone camera a certain way, and it helps me stabilize the video and reduces handheld shakiness. Now, it's in, in my experience, uh, when you record the video, you can get rid of the shakiness completely. Um, it really just comes down to how steady your hand is, but um, that stabilizer, that tripod, the way you hold it, when you hold it up with the phone, it's actually very useful. So all you need is your smartphone, and just get a little tripod and you're good to go. Facebook Live tip number three, uh, promote the broadcast as a library event. What you're seeing on the slide here is just a screenshot of the way that you might see 
uh, an upcoming episode of our flagship Facebook Live series, the Q and APL Live. And in addition to that, a question, this is a Facebook Live we did on November 30th, 2017. Uh, so very early on, I decided that, that we would promote our Facebook Live broadcasts on the library's event calendar. So we would post this uh, Facebook Live as an event next to our story times, next to our classes, next to our uh, book clubs, uh, because it is, uh, you know, library staff are using library time and library resources to organize this. So uh, all events are created equal on the library's event calendar. So I put it up there, and that's just one way to, um, to promote your event outside of social media. So the last tip, Facebook Live tip number four, uh, broadcast a fun, focused conversation. Fun as in casual, not overly scripted. Um, it's ultimately up to you how scripted you want it to be and how, how much you can memorize of a script. Um, I would say don't be, don't overdo it and just don't be afraid to make mistakes because those are perfectly fine and that's part of the charm of, of, face, of live video, I think, is being able to see just regular people uh, that happen to be library staff members make mistakes and try to recover and that those mistakes become teachable moments as it happens. Uh, spontaneity is fun too, so um, that's definitely encouraged. Uh, so you want to broadcast something fun and you want to make it focused, you know, focused on a question, on a topic, an event, anything related to the library, anything that might uh, get people's interest in coming to the library or using a certain resource. It, as long as it's focused on something, um, I think that's that's all you really need to worry about. So the last part of this tip is just, if it's possible, uh, get yourself a Facebook Live team of uh, three people so that you have one person behind the camera, one person on camera, and one person monitoring comments either on camera or, or somewhere else uh, in the building, in the library. And I, vid I videotape, I record about 99% of the Facebook Live videos. I've recorded all the Q and APL Live series videos, and I'm one whole, it's my smartphone, so I just hold it up, and I actually talk to the person on camera and the person monitoring comments, and amongst the three of us, we just kind of chat amongst ourselves. We try to stay on topic, and we just try to invite viewers to join our conversation. And the reason that I think it's important to um, to have it's just someone behind camera talking to the person on camera or just to have some sort of conversation is because earlier in an earlier slide, I, I mentioned how sometimes we get no one watching. Uh, and that does that will happen, and it's it's nothing to be discouraged about, but sometimes people just won't watch. So um, the whole point of Facebook Live is to engage with people watching, and if no one is watching, <laughs> I kinda, that, there's going to be a lot of dead air there. So if you just plan to have some sort of conversation on Facebook Live, uh, you can still be confident in the fact that once it's over, you can still it, it, it'll still be it'll be viewed, and if depending on the topic you you cover, you can actually use the Facebook Live video and reshare it or, or, or take it out of the Facebook by embedding it on your website or a blog or something like that. So that would be uh, the end of my tips here. Wow, fantastic. So exciting. Really, really powerful to see the ways you've been using Facebook Live. I wanted to mention that um, there's uh, the Milwaukee Public Library, I'm going to put this video in there, live streamed their Lucha Libre event that they hosted uh, uh, just earlier this month. And uh, so that's a perfect example of some pretty big <laughs> live streaming events that you could do at your library. Um, I just featured them in the social library edition that I published uh, just today, and I want to be sure I forgot to mention that during this session, that I uh, go through a couple times a month and find examples of things that libraries are doing uh, on mostly on Facebook and um, APL was featured for their live streaming in an earlier edition of Social Library, one of the ways that I tracked uh, Caesar down. So I really want to thank you for sharing all of those great tips. There have been some great questions specific to Facebook Live. Um, thanks for the tip on uh, your, the equipment that you use. People were curious how you uh, keep steady. Someone asked about using a laptop versus a mobile phone, and it sounds like your focus is really um, looking out, not necessarily sitting behind your laptop and speaking. That's correct, right? That is correct, Jennifer. Um, that's a good question. Um, I find uh, we've 
we found it more, um, I suppose, the video to be more interesting if I move around a little bit. And sometimes, you know, if I use my own smart, or any smartphone really, I don't think you can, you can't zoom in as the the video is happening. So you literally have to be sometimes in your coworker's face to to uh, talk to them and make the video. So I I do the tripod because it lets me move around. It lets me create a different shot and it, and frame it in different ways just to make it interesting to look at on top of everything else. Okay, yeah, and it seems like an iPad. I've seen people using iPads for that purpose. Yeah, they can. It's just iPod, iPads are, are larger than iPhones, so iPads are heavier, and it's just up to, totally up to you if you're willing to hold up an iPad um, uh, with your bare hands if you don't have a stabilizer to hold it up for like 20 or 30 minutes. If you're comfortable doing that, then absolutely, yeah. Right. Um, so there have been a couple questions about how long your segments are. Um, someone talked about would it be a good idea to use to record a book club meeting? Um, how 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 long are your segments usually? On average, our Facebook Live seg segments are uh, between 15 and 20 minutes, and that's especially true for the Q and APL Live series where we pose the question and then answer it. Um, sometimes we don't really need more than 30 minutes to do that. There, are, there has been one or two Facebook Lives, um, which was, I think, an author talk that was given. I didn't record it, but um, it happened on our Facebook page, and that talk was about an hour long. Um, I guess it's, it really just depends on how much, like on the topic itself, on the event, if you think people will watch, if there's some utility, uh, if you'll get some utility out of having this as a Facebook Live video, not just as it happens, but maybe afterward, you know, mm -hmm. if it's something you want to recycle in some way, um, certainly it can be longer than 30 minutes or certainly it can be an entire author talk from beginning to end. Um, it's really it's really just up to you, like how how you want to use it. I would just recommend to be strategic about it. Like, do you want to just have, this is going to be a one-off event where it's never going to happen again, then maybe you do want to capture it on Facebook Live, but, mm -hmm. you know, just be strategic about it. Okay. There's a great question about any tips for making your Facebook Live episodes handicapped accessible. Have you, um, I, I, I see some Facebook, uh, not, I don't think I've ever seen the live sessions closed caption, but do you, have you investigated how to do that? I have investigated the closed captioning, and we cannot close captions through when you do Facebook Live through a mobile device. And mm -hmm. so that's where I'm kind of we're kind of stuck in a way because all I have available is the mobile device. Um, the way to do closed captioning is you would need to feed your Facebook Live video through. I think um, you would need like a laptop or computer with certain software, and you connect the laptop to like a high-end camera, and then the camera feeds, and you record Facebook Live through the camera into your computer and then through the computer you connect to Facebook so it's like this broadcasting network you have to set up in order for the closed captioning to happen so okay yeah so it's a little that's complicated good to know. worth worth investigating for sure yeah excellent yeah. all right um, well somebody put a sort of a big question out there and I just want to put it out there verbally um, Someone said, will the loss of net neutrality affect the way Facebook interacts with library schools and other nonprofits? And if people have been talking about that, it'd be great to hear in chat as well. I don't know if you, either of you have comments on that at this point. Well, my understanding is that net neutrality, uh, it, it's going to change because of Congress, but, uh, or the, the the election commission, the communications commission, but um, it's not changing just yet. So it remains to be seen how it's going to affect libraries and Facebook Live. Right, right. Yeah, okay. and all I could think of is that um, one of the things we saw before uh, the rules were in place um, during the Obama administration was that large corporations were. Um, uh, slowing other corporations uh, broadcast to a trickle. And I, I think if that's one of the effects that we can probably count on, on Twitter and Facebook to uh, protect their bandwidth. And um, yeah, that I, I'm, yeah, I'm not really worried about social media. Yeah, well, it will certainly be interesting to see what comes. Um, 
I do wanted to also, I, you mentioned, Caesar, that you use uh, events to let folks know when you have live events coming up. Do you also communicate that kind of information directly with your ambassadors? Is that a part of your message, a regular message, or do you just assume that they're probably following and, and will jump in with, with their ambassadorship through the, through the Facebook or through their feeds? Um, sometimes we do communicate our upcoming live broadcasts. We certainly communicated the fact that we had scheduled a live broadcast before we closed the old central library in order to open the new central library. That was uh, a big push for us. Um, we don't do it all the time. Um, sometimes the ambassadors on their own will find out that we're doing it because um, we've tried to clue them into the fact that we, we schedule our posts I mean, our live broadcast as much as possible ahead of time. Um, so it's it's a little of both. Sometimes they'll find it on their own, but um, and sometimes we'll email them about it. But if not, if we don't do either of those things, we just put leave it on the event calendar and just go with it. Okay. Yeah. And is your is your mobile device your own or the library's? It is my own device. It's my personal um, iPhone, and um, yeah. So, and I, I'm I'm not able to get from my library uh, an iPhone, so I just use my own. And it's it's okay because when you're, you I use a Facebook account that is um, that who, that basically technically belongs to the Austin Public Library. So I use that account. I, I log into the Facebook app, but anything you do with Facebook Live, it goes directly. It's posted directly to the Facebook page. So there's nothing being saved on my personal device. There's nothing that can be captured there. It's just all directly into Facebook. So that's why I'm comfortable using my personal device. Okay, excellent. And I see a little bit of um, some folks sharing that the, the connection between YouTube and Facebook in terms of as an option for um, uh, adding captions. I do know that that can be done. I'll, I'll try to uh, seek out some resources that uh, outline that process and add that to the event page, but if anyone's got that experience, feel free to chime in. A reminder, too, that the Facebook groups that we mentioned, especially the libraries and social media group, is an excellent place to get tips from others who have been exploring uh, some of these great ideas as well. I, every day I go and I'm amazed at all the great ideas that I see shared, shared there. So if you're running into problems, get stumped, or need a little inspiration, uh, be sure to head on over there as well. Well, I'm going to, uh, we've got just a couple more things uh, since we've got a bit of time. I was really curious also to check in with folks. I mentioned that the survey is something that we've been collecting and if you haven't yet taken the survey, you have a little bit more time. We're gonna close it down uh, tomorrow morning and start uh, looking at the results of the survey and uh, share those uh, results with you after the new year, thanks to TechSoup uh, for helping us with this great work. And uh, in the survey, one of the questions we asked you all uh, is about what you are using social media for. And one of the, one of the questions, uh, or one of the ways we looked at your responses was to understand the ways that you would like to start using Facebook, or start, start using social media more. So I thought we would have a little bit of a, um, interactivity here and get some thoughts from you all on how you would like to use uh, your social media a little bit more. And I'm going to give you access to our annotation tools. So uh, you'll see over to the far left corner of the slide, there's a little marker. And if you click on that marker, it will turn blue and you'll get this panel on the left side of your menu. And uh, go down to the square, and then there's another little teeny tiny arrow that gives you access to a check mark. So click on that check mark and feel free to use this slide to test your check mark. And I'll know that you all have access perfect once I see all those check marks uh, coming up there. Excellent, all right, now I'm gonna ask you to hold your check mark and um, I'd love for you to think about three of the things that you see that you would like to explore a little bit further. So hold your check marks, everybody. Hold your check marks. All right, and here are some of the top, uh, top ideas that folks talked about wanting to 
start using on social media more. And I know some of these are a little bit more platform specific, but some of them cross over. So just to, uh, I think everyone's ready to live stream after your presentation, Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so that'll be good to circle back and, and take a look at what libraries are doing. Uh, this idea of images of work life behind the scenes, I love the way people talk about uh, staff as ambassadors. I think we can always do a better job of really showing all the different things that are happening, all the different roles that we play in libraries. I love that. Uh, readers and or reference uh, advisory is another, looks like another top. It looks like lots of people are saying all of the above as well. <laughs> so, so those of you who are answering here probably have answered uh, in the survey already. So, well, I'm so excited uh, that people are excited about exploring some of the different ways to use social media. I encourage you all to for sure uh, take a closer look if you were not uh, part of the earlier sessions because we dive a little bit in, in, deeper into some of the other platforms. And uh, I know we, we were really focused on uh, Facebook, talking more generally about Facebook today. So be sure to check those out. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be, uh, I'll follow up with you today once today's uh, uh, recording is available. And all of those recordings are will be available to you all to share with your colleagues and uh, teammates, perhaps some of your youth advisory board folks, if you have teens engaged with your social media, lots of folks to benefit from the learning. And again, the Facebook group, Libraries and Social Media, Lisa Bunker is one of the founders of that group. So really great to have uh, Lisa's expertise and look forward to seeing more folks joining in in the conversations in that group as well. And I wanna thank uh, especially Molly for joining us as a TechSoup for Libraries staffer and being here for the series with us. It's been really great working with you and thank you again to Caesar and Lisa for your great work. And we look forward to continuing to follow all the great work you all are doing in your libraries and uh, being prepared for whatever is to come with social media and our communities that use them. So thank you all very much for being here. And thank you to our captioner for today. Everyone have an excellent day. Take thank care. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.